You already know I'm obsessed with it. I can't get enough. Back with another video involving tyrannosaurs, and I know, I know, this might come as a shock given the sheer variety of my content, but 2024 has been an S-tier year for the tyrant lizards. So when Edge Science kindly asked me to be part of this year's Paleo Rewind, how could I say no? I mean, really. How could I say no? Welcome back to Extinct on Impact. My name is A, and for those who don't know, Paleo Rewind is an annual series organized by Edge that brings together different paleo YouTubers with the goal of looking back at some of the year's most exciting paleontological discoveries. So I'm in charge of July, and I'ma be real with ya, I'm not gonna do it proper justice because let me tell you, this was a busy month for paleontology, and choosing only a few topics was definitely not easy. I mean, the Tyrannosaur stuff was, but anyway, if you haven't already, go watch Duplex Does Arts coverage of June over on their channel Channel, and without further ado, let's start things off with something big. So for those of us who grew up lugging around a ragged copy of the Jurassic Park 3 Dinosaur Field Guide, the size of Tyrannosaurus Rex is something that's been burned into our brains. Well, what if I told you that, statistically speaking, that estimate doesn't even come close to the most massive T-Rex possible? The thing is, sampling the largest members of even living animals is tough enough. I mean, let's say you're out on a hike and suddenly you spot an absolutely massive grizzly bear just barreling toward you. And as you curl up, like a pill bug and prepare for a good old fashioned mauling, you think this has to be the biggest grizzly to ever exist. But statistically, you'd almost certainly be wrong, even if it doesn't feel like it. And this problem is way more complicated when we're dealing with the notoriously patchy fossil record. Well, a July study by doctors Jordan Mallon and Dave Hone tackled this challenge of estimating the absolute upper limit of body size in extinct species. And naturally, they used T Rex as a model. I mean, of course, what else are they gonna use? Coelophysis? Go back to Ghost Ranch, dude. Now, we have 84 reasonably complete specimens of T-Rex, which is pretty impressive for a dinosaur. But when you consider that an estimated 2.5 billion T-Rex individuals may have existed throughout their tyrannical term, thinking we've somehow found the largest individual ever is probably an unhealthy level of optimism. So what the researchers did is generate a hypothetical population of 140 million T-Rexes, which they then slapped on a growth curve to see how body mass vary around the average. And based on this model, the likelihood that we've already collected specimens from the 99th percentile of body body mass is actually pretty good. But finding the absolute biggest individuals of all time, the ones in the 99.99th percentile of body mass, the true genetic freaks of the T-Rex world, could take hundreds or even thousands of years, assuming they fossilized at all. And this harsh reality isn't just exclusive to T-Rex. It applies to any species that can only be studied through the fossil record. Now, as for the largest T-Rex possible, the researchers estimate it could have weighed around 15 metric tons. That's a staggering 70% larger than Scotty, the current heavyweight champion of the T-Rex world, which sits at around 8.9 tons. And this thing would have been an absolute behemoth, stretching about 15 meters, or just under 50 feet in length. But hey, we've talked about the Bane of Laramidia long enough. Now it's time to grab a shovel and dig straight down to China, and if you get tired, well that's too damn bad, because July also saw the description of a new Tyrannosaur from China named Asia Tyrannus Zhui, which lived at the very end of the late Cretaceous. It's known from a nearly complete skull, as well as a handful of postcranial remains, including some tail vertebrae and parts of the hind limbs. It was only about three and a half to four meters long, or 11 and a half to 13 feet, which is on the smaller side for a tyrannosaur. But keep in mind, it wasn't quite done growing yet. Regardless, it was only about half the size of its larger brother in Kyanjusaurus, which I'm sure Asia Tyrannus was just thrilled to be sharing the same habitat with. So how did that work? Well, unlike Kyanjusaurus, which is well known for its elongated snout, Asia Tyrannus had a notably deeper snout, more like your quintessential Tyrannosaurid skull. These morphological differences suggest the two were able to coexist peacefully-ish by occupying different roles in the ecosystem and having their own unique feeding strategies. Meaning, for the most part, Asia Tyrannus didn't have to worry too much about old Pinocchio Rex sticking its pencil nose where it didn't belong. By the way, there were a ton of other prehistoric species described in July, and at the very least, I want to quickly mention a few of them here. So what I'm going to do is like a quick fire Gomu Gomu Gatling rundown thing here. First up, we have Bionosaurus biogiensis, an early stegosaur from the middle Jurassic of China. It was a transitional species and offers valuable insight into the early divergence of stegosaurs from their ankylosaur relatives. 
very cool. Next up we have Enalioites Schroederi, a metriorhynchid crocodilomorph from early Cretaceous Germany. This marine crocodile stands out for its three-dimensionally preserved skull, which offers researchers the opportunity to study its internal anatomy in unprecedented detail. Then there's Fauna herzegae, a small Thescalosaur from mid-Cretaceous Utah. Its unique pelvic and limb adaptations point to a semi-fossorial lifestyle, meaning this little guy was a burrower and likely spent much of its time underground. And the last one I'll mention is a new Pseudosuchian archosaur from the Middle Triassic of Nevada named Bangwig Wishingasuchus Eremecarminus. I feel like my furniture is going to start floating. What's crazy is that despite being a terrestrial animal, this Pseudosuchian was found in marine sediments, supporting the idea that these crocodile relatives were getting their feet wet, so to speak, all across the globe during the Middle Triassic. And I do apologize if I treated these discoveries like Squidward at the talent show. They're all really fascinating and you should definitely check them out. Links to all studies will be down in the description. Now we're taking a look at the largest living lizard, the Komodo dragon, which I think is a top contender for most terrifying terrestrial predator on the planet. I like to think that Godzilla made a mistake in the heat of passion, and now we have these testosterone-fueled slabs of muscle duking it out Harambe style. What makes them even more nightmarish is that they're one of the few living animals equipped with the Xiphodon teeth, the blade-like serrated teeth wielded by most theropod dinosaurs. But it gets even better. Using advanced imaging techniques, researchers found that the tips and serrations of their dagger-shaped teeth are coated with a thin layer of iron, primarily composed of ferrohydrite. And if that doesn't belong in the Nature is Metal subreddit, I really don't know what does. Come to think of it, that old photo I took during a university field trip a few years ago is feeling a little bit more eerie now. This metal coating reinforces the teeth, enhancing their sharpness and durability, which enables these lizards to rip and tear through prey with brutal efficiency. The researchers also analyzed theropod teeth, which showed no evidence of iron coatings. But keep in mind the iron may have simply been lost due to diagenesis, the chemical changes that occurred during fossilization. However, they did find that large theropods like the Tyrannosaurids had wavy enamel along their serrations. This structural adaptation likely kept their teeth sharp and protected them from cracking, an absolutely critical feature Feature considering the immense forces these animals could generate. These findings suggest that while both groups developed highly efficient cutting teeth, they just took very different evolutionary paths to achieve it. And this is probably my favorite kind of study because it bridges the worlds of paleontology and zoology and reminds us that monsters aren't just relics of the past. And finally, I wanted to cover another topic that blends paleontology with another field, this time archaeology. Okay, so if your first reaction to spotting an armadillo rooting up your yard is to shout, mate, back on the menu, boys, then you probably have leprosy. But to ancient humans, they were clearly a delicacy. And we know this because a July study revealed fossils from Argentina showing clear evidence of human butchering on a giant prehistoric armadillo known as the Glyptodont, specifically the genus Neosclerocalyptus. The evidence included 32 cut marks with features like V-shaped cross-sections, Hertzian cones, and microstriations, all hallmarks of butchering with stone tools, scattered across the pelvis, caudal vertebrae, and even the armored tail rings. And it's no surprise that these early humans focused on the hindquarters, as this is typically the plumpest and most muscle-rich part of the body in most vertebrates. Now this is not the first time we've found evidence of humans hunting glyptodonts in South America. However, radiocarbon dating places these remains at around 21,000 years old, a time during the last glacial maximum. That's a whopping 6,000 years older than the previous evidence of humans interacting with megafauna on the continent. This finding significantly pushes back our timeline of human settlement in southern South America, as far back as perhaps 30,000 years ago. It's a fascinating study that highlights just how a single discovery can completely reshape our understanding of the past. But anyway, that's all from me. July was an insane month for paleontology, and I honestly wish I could have covered it better. We had burrowing dinosaurs, iron-toothed dragons, ancient butchers, and there was even a little something for the T-Rex fanboys. <laughs> A big thank you to Edge for inviting me to be part of 2024's Paleo Rewind. Check out the description for links to all the awesome Paleo YouTubers involved. And on January 1st, be sure to head over to Edge Science to watch everyone's Paleo Rewind video all nicely burritoed up into one compilation. But until next time, my fellow dino dweebs, I hope you had a merry Knishmas or Krimbus, and for real, have a happy new year. <laughs>